I know. <laughs> okay, so Melanie, all right, Mia, are you on yet? Okay, so so far Melanie has said that the stereotypes of Islam and the Quran are very different from what we hear, what the politicians say, what the social media says. Uh, what we get is driven by fear, driven by power hungry politicians who want us to have someone to blame for our problems, some reason to engage militarily, some reason to have an arms build up and help the corporations make more money and then they'll donate to political campaigns. Um, all sorts of ulterior motives, which are kinds of ignorance and they lead to violence. So all of the religions are like that. They all preach kindness, forgiveness, compassion, uh, sustainability, respect for the creation. And they all get completely subverted and turned around by people with ulterior motives power, glory, money, or people who follow them and they want to believe these people are in charge, they want security, they want someone to blame, or they want some justification for their desire to be successful and rich at the expense of somebody who's Muslim. Um, anyway, so those are that's just important, I think, for college students to learn that. I think that you know, there's lots of stuff you have to learn in college, but seeing through these religious issues, especially right now in history, because at this moment, democracy is losing its grip, right? Authoritarianism is on the rise and religion is being weaponized. So I've been teaching this class for decades but it's never become quite as relevant as it is right now because the extent of weaponizing religion has just increased, a huge increase very recently. Well, since 9-11, but it just keeps getting worse. So that was um, Melanie's comment. And then Jack um, likes the Quran. It really sounds like the Old Testament, yes. I mean, it has Abraham and Moses and Aaron and, you know, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, God, I can't remember all their names. But I mean, I remember reading it. And I, it was only recently, like I was 50 before I actually read it, which is really sad because I'm in philosophy and not technically in religion, although... These are philosophies. That was an enlightenment putting down of these traditions. But um, yeah, so when, when I say that someone who's Confucius, uh, Hindu or Buddhist watches while the Christians and the Muslims try to commit genocide, you know, they're killing each other and destroying the earth, they're going to go, what the heck? You guys are cousins. Like, what is this? <laughs> right? You have the same Moses and, uh, it, you know, you have all the same characters. You have the same stories. What the heck? I think, you know, they would just think, get rid of those religions of the book. Let's, let's get to mysticism. <laughs> I mean, they're creating bad karma, right? In the name of their religious book or quoting from their books and creating all this bad karma. So forget it, start over. What about you, Mia? And then the Big Bang, we'll go over that, Jack. I'll, I'll give you some, some pointers about that or some ideas. And then the Surya 19, uh, Surya 9 is often quoted by Islamophobes. And it actually, if you take it in historical context, which is exactly the same as the Old Testament. There's some really horrible things in the Old Testament. But if you take the Dr. Duby's classes, right? Old Testament, New Testament, 
then you get all this context. And um, students really, you know, if they if they are curious about those things, they like that class, you know. If they're raised that every word is inerrant, that they, they have trouble with the class. <laughs> but um, uh, so if if it those are questions you're curious about, I would recommend those classes. So, okay, Mia, what do you have? Well, I guess mine was kind of like the linking thing between uh, Jack's statement and Melanie's, which was that I don't know. In the U.S., typically Christianity is kind of the thing that, like, that's the, like, main religion or whatever. And I just think it's interesting because reading the, is it Quran? I guess that's how you say it. Like, like Jack kind of said, it's not really all that different from, like, re like le reading and learning the teachings of Christianity. And so, like, I don't know, I kind of have, like, this whole thought list going down, like, as my thoughts, like, reading it. And it's, like, one of the things was, like, I don't understand, like, why why there's so much turmoil between the two because we're so similar but then that's also the issue because it's like a power thing and especially like with the u.s like we have a superiority complex for sure and oh like when it comes to like things like oh especially with like money it's like we people like the u.s can literally capitalize off of saying like hey like muslims are bad people this is what they do 9-11 oh see like I, and they can like make money off of it, saying things like that like or like marketing uh you know islam in that sort of way like i don't know i just it's oh yeah and the thing i wrote down the similarity thing was how christianity like we use i don't i just wrote down word but i don't know if it was like the word of god or the living word or something but like it comes from the quran apparently i remember reading something like that in one of the outlines that we read yeah one of the articles. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Which book says that Jesus was the Messiah? Oh, the Quran. <laughs> but, you know, and then he says, yeah, and it also says Jesus was not blah, blah, whatever, right? So yeah. you definitely have to pick and choose your quotes. Um, I mean, the punchline is if you want to start a religious war, you may, you can find the quotes, right? But it's not the spirit of the religion. If there's 171 quotes of God is compassionate, you know, and 40 that God is gets angry and vengeful, well, you know, <laughs> and then the Old Testament. God is much more authoritarian, the New Testament not. It's just, so I guess to me, the punchline is just like the Oracle at Delphi, the book is a riddle, right? The book doesn't solve itself. You are responsible for how you interpret it. Right. And if you think you're going to stand before God, you know, you can't say, oh, well, I it says in the Bible, blah. And, and God will say, yeah, but it also says blah. <laughs> right. And so it just seems to me, if you think that, if you think you have to stand before God to get in the pearly gates, you better have a pretty good argument for how you interpreted it, right? And which quotes you picked. Uh, I can't imagine standing in front of God and saying, well, I destroyed the creation knowing we were doing, I thought because I just thought, you know, you thought it'd be okay because, you know, of this quote or something. <laughs> like, I don't think so, right? I'm not, I wouldn't want to risk eternal damnation. <laughs> thinking somehow God's okay because I decided that he decided that it was time, right? To end the creation, as long as I can drive my gas guzzling truck and live in my gas guzzling house, right? <laughs> Does that make sense to you, Mia? It, it's so childish. If you think about it, it sounds like a two-year-old making deals with their dad, you know? or a teenager at best. Uh, I don't know, any other comments, Mia? 
I mean, not really. That's that was pretty much the gist of kind of what I really wanted to talk about. I, yeah, yeah. You said you would get into the Big Bang. Like, I'm kind of interested in that. So, well, I was actually I was going to ask for an example from your small town in Texas. I mean, do you think people think how do you know? What have you heard, or how do you think people think about Muslims or the Quran or something? Well, so, I mean, it's very, very frowned upon. Obviously, like, I'm from a very conservative small town, which means everyone is, like, some sort of, I guess, branch of Christianity. And then they have opinions about that, too. But uh, with that, like, I guess within my own family, uh, my the guy that my mom used to be married to my step old stepdad i guess he in the air force and he served in the air force uh during the time of 9 11. and so he had a lot of opinions on stuff like that because i mean he wasn't he's not necessarily the most educated man uh to be in the military you surprisingly don't have to have the highest education ever um you can just serve uh, which I think is an issue, but that's a whole other thing. Um, he, so he, he was, he was very opinionated on it. He didn't like seeing people wearing, um, I, I, I know it's, I, don't, I know it's kind of a stereotype, but I don't, and I'm not even sure if it's Muslims that do it, but isn't it like, oh, they wear like the wraps and stuff. I, uh, what is it called? I don't know. I'm really struggling. But when he saw people wearing things like that, he would automatically associate it with Islam and like, oh, terrorists. And then, um, I don't know. There's just not a lot of room for it. Like when people talk about it, when my own family talks about it, like just no, no one has nice things to say. Like there isn't any respect given. It's not like people who fall under that kind of like, or fall under Muslim, like people who are Muslim, I guess, like they do not get the same respect. Uh, like they're, I don't know, sort of like culture, I guess, isn't respected. Like they're just not thought of as people. They're just like bad like that's how it's yeah actually this one girl said her grandma they were at some kind of a county fair in batesville and there was a woman in a haji right or a burka mm -hmm. and she said how much you want to bet she's got a gun underneath there and her grandma had been diagnosed with a paranoia disorder and was carrying around a gun to protect herself i mean really yeah, so my stepdad did the same thing. He used to carry around guns, but well, not my. We were at a carnival sort of thing, or it was like we have the San Angelo stock show and rodeo, and part of that is like the carnival. And um, we were at the carnival, we were like in line for one of the rides, and one of the girls that attended my high school, she wore the hijab, is that what we say? I guess she wore one. And my stepdad made a whole lot of really inappropriate jokes about like how she probably had like bombs or she was like a suicide bomber or um he wouldn't let us get on the ride it was a closed ride and it was like one that you it's not seat belted in but it's like the door's closed you're like inside of something and he was like if i can't see you then you can't be put in there because how do i know so it was like yeah can you imagine what would happen to that woman if there were an accident i mean right i mean in some ways she could she should get a different job in case there were an accident because she would really be killed or tortured i mean there's no question what would happen yeah i mean she automatically takes the blame even if it's like a completely oh, yeah totally um, um anyway okay so we've established that there's unjustified stereotypes about Muslims in the US, um, that religion has come to be just a brand, nothing more than a brand. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with character traits. Because if you go back to the character traits, you wouldn't have all that, right? You just wouldn't have the animosity. And American exceptionalism, right? We're different, we're special. <laughs> uh yeah we, that's a big problem and it always takes nations down whenever a country thinks they're better without making a moral effort 
they'll get taken down because another country will say there's they're just too full of themselves and we can you know we can punch their buttons and they're they're going to go for it actually the 9 11 the strategy there was just to bomb once and then to sit back and let america destroy itself right just let the 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 public divide itself against itself and implode that was the plan and it works i mean a lot of oppressed people are passive aggressive like that right they know somebody's full of themselves and they'll just punch a button and step step away and let the person self-destruct um and i think it worked actually <laughs> um but anyway so let's go I'm going to give you a, um, an overview of just all the stuff we're going to do, we're doing, we're in the midst of. So you can see there's the same categories in each religion. And um, just kind of quickly do this. So we had that it's misunderstood. Hopefully by now you will agree with that. It's been misunderstood, has the same roots, a lot of the same characters, the same story about the Hebrews going from Egypt to Israel, the same story of Moses being called by God and saying, no, no, I'm not a good speaker. Send my brother Aaron. He's better. I could identify with that boy. Anyway. Um, so all those stories, there's, um, there is this overall story about the sons of Abraham are special. And Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. I told you that Jesus died too soon. And so God sent through Gabriel, the Quran to finish the job and teach people what they need to do each day as adults, you know, when they get married and they have kids and they got to get a job and they're a business person and they're a political leader because Jesus didn't do any of that. So, so, I mean, it's a story and um, it would, it could be compelling. It just means that if you aren't from this particular uh, strain of human history, or if you don't convert, then you're in trouble. And of course, philosopher is never going to agree to that, that you aren't different, you aren't special because of that. Um, so philosophy will go to the common ground and a philosopher would never accept that, um, at least the way I define philosophy. Um, all right. So Muhammad had all those character traits when he was little, serious little kid, just like Buddha, Jesus um socrates muhammad the gandhi all those stories luther if you want it you can keep going and there's women and there's frederick Douglass, and you know you can be black any sort of ethnicity any sort of gender there's these certain character traits that start when kids are young and when they come of age they decide to be serious about life um, so, uh, Muhammad joined this group of Hanifs, and then he felt that Gabriel came and proclaimed, um, spoke through him the Quran. That's interesting because, of course, Gabriel also told Mary that she was pregnant with God's son. So that Gabriel gets around uh, in, in the big moments. Um, he didn't pander to miracles, so exactly like Jesus, exactly like Socrates, you know, didn't inflate his own image. All these characters are the same. Buddha, um, the miracle of creation, right? All of these, all of these, what, icons of morality, of virtue would not spend more money than they need, they would not do anything to destroy the creation. Um, they really focus on sustainability. 
so did Gandhi, so did Martin Luther King. He, he turned from racism to greed as major problems in our society. Um, they all had trouble with the establishment because religion got institutionalized and then it got weaponized, which is exactly what's happening right now. They care more about money and power than they care about truth and justice. Same thing that happened in Athens, but in the name of the Olympian gods, right? Uh, challenge the social order, all the same. Socrates is a stone cutter talking to the aristocrats. Confucius was an orphan. Muhammad was an orphan. Buddha was born in the aristocratic class, but he gave it all up. Okay, uh, Medina, uh, it was he, he fused together the five tribes, three of them Jewish into a confederation. He had a, he had a charter of Medina. He gave the Jews and the Christians protection, right? Right to be protected. They could not build churches and they could, and they had to pay more taxes, but that was it. That was extremely progressive, extremely tolerant. And after he died, Damascus was the city. And then after, after that, it was um, in Iraq. It was Damascus, Syria, and then the major city became the, the capital of Iraq. They were very tolerant cities at first. The big problems they had were between the Sunnis and the Shia. <laughs> that was the huge animosity. But anyway, so the Quran is the center of faith. They tend to read it literally. So, um, but, Okay, so the Quran, because it was inspired in this very, very literal way, like supposedly the Bible is inerrant, but clearly it was written by a lot of different people and clearly they didn't agree. They had different ideas of God. They, they lived in different historical times, right? So the Old and New Testaments are directly historical. They start out with historical stories and indirectly doctrinal. So it's hard to dig a doctrine out of the Old Testament because there's so many different writers and stories. But the Quran lends itself to that. And so the way that you get out of the fundamentalism in, in, in uh, Islam is that there's the, the, um, the earthly Quran that got written down, but then the real Quran is written in the heart of the person, the believer. And the same thing happens with Jesus. He's, you know, he quotes from the Old Testament. He says, it is said, and he reads it, but I say. So he says, basically, the whole Old Testament amounts to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, I will write the law on their hearts. So that is the same move, right? You have to have it written in your heart. Then you'll have those character traits. And then you'll live the life that they want you to and they give you guidelines. But you cannot fixate on the earthly Quran or the, the literal books, the black marks on white paper, you know, every one of those traditions, Buddha rejected the black marks on white paper, you know, the Vedas, the literalism, because that's what get used, gets used as a tool by religious leaders. That's what can get weaponized. Um, all right, so there's no dramatic narratives. It's just this constant voice of from God through Gabriel, through Muhammad onto the paper. Um, okay, the unity, omnipotence, omniscience and mercy of God. So if God is all powerful, all knowing, then there's only one God, right? I mean, suppose God were not, 
all powerful. Well, then there'd have to be a, either another God or God would have a defect. And it's no, <laughs> you know, there can only be one of these. So the one in the Quran and the one in the Old Testament, the one in the, it has to be the same being because of the character traits that are given to them. Um, let's see. And the, and the Muslims do memorize them a lot. And they're very um, reverential toward the Quran. And um, it's poetry, so it's easier to memorize. It flows easy. The basic concepts. Um, let's see. All right. So there's a quote. God, that, that God has begotten a son, you know? No, that's not true. Um, in the artwork, if you go to a cathedral, you get pictures of G stories of Jesus, like Jesus surrounded by children, because there's a Bible story about that, or Jesus, the good shepherd, or whatever. But in, in Islam, if you go to a mosque, it's beautiful sort of weaving together of lines, calligraphy, but there's no images at all because that's personifying God in a way that God is not, right? You don't want to anthropomorphize God. So that's, a, you know, that's different. Whereas the idea that Jesus is God, oh yeah, you can anthropomorphize because that's the way it is. So God's mercy, right? 192 merciful and um, only 17 citations of wrath and vengeance. You know, I mean, really? What's the spirit of being a Muslim is to be merciful. Um, all right. It means surrender the day of judgment. This is something supposedly Christians and Muslims absolutely agree on and that's what i was saying like boy you guys have really a different idea of what you know what that conversation how that conversation is going to go <laughs> i can't i mean i actually have trouble thinking like that but if you do think like that i mean the idea that you could look god in the face and say it you know I figured it was your, you know, it was the end times. And so I didn't do anything. I can't imagine that. <laughs> then the five pillars, the prayers, uh, Ramadan, the social teachings are the same in all the books. Um, there are different types of Islam. I pointed out to you, there's also a contemplative mystical tradition in the Catholic tradition, the nuns and the priests the monasteries, uh, definitely in Hindu, there's the path to God via the yogi and Buddha meditation. So those are similar. Um, and there was a big problem, of course. So the issues have more to do with economics and politics than they do with the original spirit of the, the tradition. I'll just call it a tradition. It's a wisdom tradition and it gets corrupted. Um, and then Colin Powell, you know, there was all this Islamophobia and I don't know, one day if you know this, but he was a department of defense. And there's a number of Muslim Americans that fight in the military, lots of them. And um, so he just, Barack Obama was, was you know, getting dissed as a Muslim when he's running for president. And Colin Powell, the head of the Department of Defense says, what if he was like, who cares? That doesn't mean anything. Um, one of the speakers at the Democratic National Convention was a Muslim American whose son had died in Iraq and gotten a gold star for his behavior, right, his courage. And um, so that, that was, that the point is that the religion shouldn't divide us. And then Keith Ellison was sworn into office and he checked out a Quran from Thomas Jefferson's library. 
And my mother voted for him, incidentally. That's kind of how I know that. Um, all right, so we have um, this. I think we've already gone over that, right? They, it's all the same analogies. If you want to write your, if you want to include any of this in your final paper, um, then we go back and we can go through all the different Aristotelian virtues and see that they all had that. Then for today, it was the creation. So let me talk a little bit about creation. Um, so what does it mean, right? And um, did time exist? All right. I remember for some reason I used to ponder stuff like this. Um, and even in high school, I did, whether the universe is created or eternal. And um, I, I thought it's really important. And it actually is really important. But, you know, I, yeah, it's hard to convince students of that. But if it's created, then God can control anything. And God can come on in and change climate change, right? just whatever God wants to do. God has complete control of the creations, like silly buddy, whatever I want to do. Um, if it's eternal, then it just emerged from lower levels of complexity to higher levels of complexity. And it's just a natural force. Reality just moves toward higher and higher levels of complexity. That's just the way it works. It's the way evolution works, is that a species develops, and then there's this constant drive. Genetic mutation is always testing to see if there's a, a niche for another species. And if there is, there's going to be another one, you know, and it just gets more complex. And then the brains get bigger. And because they're dealing with more complex uh, environments, they start functioning at a different level. The animals whose brains evolve to be bigger and to function more are the ones that are fit, the ones that survive. So it just keeps going in that direction. Okay, anyway, but if, if that's true, if it was just an emergence, then the question is, did time exist before the Big Bang, right? Um, so Newtonian mechanics says, just takes absolute space and time. Aristotle says that time is relative to motion and that's relative to physical things. So when physical things emerged, then time, time is a measure of motion. So, time is relative to the motion of physical things, just like space. There's no space before there's things in space <laughs> because the things define what space is. So Aristotle would say that um, the universe is potentially infinite, but actually finite at any one point in time. So um, it's unbounded, right? So it, let's see, to say it's unbounded is to say it's always expanding, but at any one point in time, what's actual is not infinite, but there's always a potential for it to become more complex. So it's potentially infinite, but it's actually finite. And then time is just the measure of the motion. So I, I was very aware of this when I had little children, because really they live in a different time frame because their brains are not developed as much. They haven't moved as much. And um, so they live in a, they have a different sense of time. And the older you get, the more of a memory you have 
And the more you start understanding patterns, and the more you start making analogies, and the more you can see that stuff that was written 2,500 years ago is still relevant, the more you're living in a lot of different time frames, okay? Because you can study the universe and time is, means something different because you're studying things in motion that are, you know, over time, a much more extended period of time. And then when you're studying children, you have to study their brains and their brains exist in time. And so they have a much more immediate sense of time. Like life is lived right now and you have to pick them up from school. And if you're late, ink, it's going to make this imprint in their brain. Uh, whereas an adult, you know, it's not going to bother them so much because they have a different perspective because they've lived longer in time and they can see patterns and they know that it doesn't mean you disappeared from the face of the earth. Anyway, so I just want to ask you, um, Jack, does that make sense? That there wouldn't have been time until there were things in time, because time is simply the measure of the motions of things. Does that make sense to you? A little bit. Well, Einstein said time is relative to motion, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, like time is different on different planets. Yeah, it's not absolute. So he was criticizing Newtonian view of time, but that was more like Aristotle. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the reason why it's important is that if the universe simply emerged, then we can actually understand it. And there's no God that's gonna come in and change it. There's no, we're not puppets on a string, um, but we can understand it because it has evolved slowly and everything's connected to everything. And so the more we recognize the patterns that are out there and we're accurate about what's out there, the more we can sort of figure out how to live. But we also can, the more perverted we can get too. <laughs> if we know more, but um, let's see. Okay, so some people have God caused the Big Bang and once it started, he lets go, right? The universe is self-regulating. Um, actually, we're gonna, the last day of class, second, the last week of class, we'll talk about a quantum physicist who talks about his view He's a quantum physicist and an Episcopal priest. Um, God sustains the universe. Um, whereas other people think God is self-sustaining. I mean, the universe is self-sustaining. Um, but what is our relationship to God and to the natural world? That's the key, right? Whether you think you can believe in God and still knowingly undermine the creation and think that God will fix it if God wants to. So that's that's why I used to think about that a lot in high school. I, I think it's important. And I think a lot of Americans, you know, when situations get really bad, which they will, this is going to be their fallback position, right? If faith means God's in charge, right? Um, okay, so let's go to the news articles, all right? Now, I want to ask each of you, after I just, oh, yeah, all right, what are we, 848, all right, so this first article was that the scholars, you know, people quote from the Quran, and then the scholars come up. And they say, okay, you have to do the historical context. You have to differentiate between the message and the context. There's the religious, the spiritual Islam, and the political Islam. Even among the scholars, they disagree. 
um, because they quote different texts. Um, then there's secular intellectuals versus religious extremists, liberals versus conservatives. And we've been, you know, we've been reading about this, that the humanistic branch of every religion would be the liberals, right? And then the anti-humanistic branch or the literalist, the fundamentalist branches um, would advocate holy war, um, trying desperately to convert people in the belief that they'll go to hell if they're not converted, um, all that sort of stuff. So this article just reinforces a whole lot of themes that we've had running throughout the class. If you remember Euthyphro, like way back in the beginning, he took his father to court for murder because they have this tradition, miasma, that you're polluted if you share your table hospitality with somebody who you think is a criminal. And, um, and Socrates says, are you sure? You know, <laughs> if that's, you know, you're quoting literally from home, Hesiod, and the gods are doing terrible things to each other. And Socrates says, I don't think God is terrible. So that's why I'm in trouble for not believing in the city's gods. Does everybody understand it's the same old, same old? Does that make sense to you, Mia? <laughs> Nod. Does that make sense to you, Jack? Yes, ma'am. Isn't that sort of incredible? <laughs> it just, it blows my mind. What about you, Melanie? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So um, the selective conscience, um, what are we gonna do, right? Um, keeping faith with Islam in a new world and how to deal with this. Then these last two articles, I really wanna ask you about, right? The Quran was getting assigned in, as you had to have read it before you got to um, class. And, uh, okay. Their freshmen gathered to discuss their reading assignment. It was a book about the Quran. It wasn't even the Quran. And the Christian group tried to sue them, right? For um, trying to indoctrinate, forced Islamic indoctrination, right? Okay. Um, so the freshmen start coming to class and the the um, writer, the journalist is interviewing them and asking them, well, what do you think of all this? And do you remember what some of the students said? Uh, let's see, anybody remember? It was, okay. They were accusing them of state-sponsored religion because he is, they assigned a book about the Quran. All right. Um, all right. What do you think? I'm, I'm <laughs> the students thought it had been overblown. Some of them just said it was a boring book. Like, that's it. That's an honest response. But they said, we're at a liberal arts school. We're supposed to open our minds. You're supposed to get a new perspective. You don't get a new perspective by not trying to learn things, right? And they actually, one group of students said they were excited to learn about it. They found out it was, they thought it was gonna be some off the wall religion. It actually isn't. Um, whether it provided a complete picture, right? And that's where Houston Smith, you know, he's, he's pretty sympathetic toward all the religions. And so I'm the one that brings out the dark side, right? More than he does. Um, and I think they do that just because they know what they're up against. They're just giving an alternative. Um, I don't think intolerance of other religions is the guide that Christ uh, set before us to follow. 
he wanted to show that he was the way, but not through ignorance and intolerance. So reading books like this is a good way to make people more open-minded. Um, so, okay, now uh, I'm gonna ask each, each of you, and then this guy had a, had a response. So I'm gonna ask you about that too. But what did you think about the, the Christian family network taking that to court for forced Islamic indoctrination? What do you think, Melanie? Um, I mean, I, I just think that's crazy. Like, I think it's um, interesting how fearful society is of us, I don't know, accepting um, the people that we're supposed to fear or like the people that are supposed to be our enemies. Like, why? <laughs> I don't know. Um, and I also think it's sad that it's perceived that you have to be like, have a liberal arts education just to get knowledge of the other side of the world. Like we shouldn't, I don't know, everyone should, everyone should be open-minded like that and get that education, not just liberal arts. Yeah, okay. And maybe not just college students. Like, do you think in high school, like a senior in high school should know this stuff? Yeah, like, Everyone should know this stuff. It's, but it's partly a question of how, when you get to an age where you could actually really understand it and not, you know, there would be, if a kid in fourth grade can't process that, then right. it would be more like indoctrination, right? I'm, does that make sense? Yeah, I, I definitely think maybe around uh, eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade, you should start to open, be open-minded to like receive this knowledge of not just our society, but everyone else's society outside of the United States. Do you think you could teach a history class where you'd have excerpts, you know, readings from a lot of books, you know, like the Analects and things like that starting in junior high? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Just it's basic. I I think it's like basic history that we need to know. Did Did you get your history, you know, lessons? Did you read original texts, or did you just read some pavlum, uh, like the mother bird chews it all up and sort of spits it into your mouth? <laughs> yeah, it was just like we would get a different, like, big thick history book every year. But it would just be like United States based. Okay, and it didn't. Did it quote original text like from no. our founders? No. <laughs> okay, I mean because some of that stuff that our founders said, you know, when they liked Confucius Analects or something. <laughs> oh yeah, no, we didn't get any of that. <laughs> Isn't that sad though? Yeah. Oh boy. Okay, Jack, what do you think? I don't think they would be able to make a case for. Uh, religious indoctrination I think I think they should be able to learn about things I think it, it just comes from a point of fear not wanting to learn about the other side because we have more of a Christian centered society so I feel like learning about other ideas would kind of be too enticing to people what do you think our founders would think I don't think they would have a problem with it at all. Well, I mean, they liked Confucius. And Thomas yeah. Jefferson had a Koran in his library. <laughs> yeah. Would they be happy with these Christian people who are calling it forced indoctrination? No. Would they, be, would, they be, would they be worried about it? Mm -hmm. If a huge percentage of Americans think like that, that's the way Europeans thought about religion, right? It was made into a weapon. Mm -hmm. And instead of Protestants versus Catholics, it'd be Christian versus Muslim, but it's the same mental process that they were trying to get people to think critically and not 
to think like a child, you know. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you, given that paper that you wrote? Yes, ma'am. It's kind of the opposite of the educated voter. Yeah. It, it's, so it's worrisome, right? It's dangerous mm. for our democracy. It's not just funny or they're not going to win. Do you think they thought they were going to win or do you think it was just a performance? It was just part of creating this brand. Yeah. Okay. Probably more so that. The brand identity, mm -hmm. which is an empire-based religion. You're, com you're making Christianity into an empire-supporting yeah. religion, which they would have hated. Of course, it was exactly the opposite. That's why they gave you all this religious freedom. So mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to attach it to politics. So, you know, it's very ironic. Anyway, I mean, you do need to know that that is happening, that has happened, because your whole life you're going to spend in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. So you really need to know that. Um, it will affect your life. Um, Mia, what about you? What's your reaction to that article? <laughs> I mean, I'm the same way. Like, they don't, they literally don't have, like, the case for, like, they make its indoctrination is literally the most extreme that you could possibly go, and it, it's like they just I feel like there was no thought behind it either I feel like it was just like oh this is something that is threatening like the power that like what Christianity holds it's it was yeah kind of like Jack said it was a fear-based thing like uh, the making an entire case out of it was uh, like it was dumb I don't know I mean I feel like that's something that not even my school would have done and my school is pretty conservative about things Granted, I, I don't know, I didn't learn, I didn't know anything about like who Confucius was until literally this class, I, or what, like Confucius, you know, I didn't know anything about it until this class, but like, I, I just feel like that was a dream that you possibly could have gone, for, and for like what? There's nothing wrong with it, like open, like opening your mind, like having, yeah, being open-minded, like learning about new things, that you can have an understanding, that way you can form your own opinion, that way it's not like some sort of like, I don't know that way you're not being like a uh what what do they call it you're not following like a sheep like you're being able to like stand out and make your own decisions like I, I don't know that the whole case thing is dumb I did uh, that was kind of an intense thing to say but I don't I think that was but no. do you think it's dangerous too because it's persuasive to so many people of course yeah that's why that's like like exactly why I said I mean you don't get to make your own decisions when 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 situations like this happen it's like oh christianity in this context right like christianity is what is ruling and if they sort of criminalize like what uh, any other sort of religion or any other sort of opinion in, in mind like you don't you just think you assume it's wrong but you don't get to learn about all of the ideologies that go behind them like you don't get to learn you just automatically are sort of brainwashed into this opinion. Like, you know, I don't know. Yes, it's very dangerous. <laughs> Not only that, but what would happen in your town if somebody had a hijab on and she went to interview for a job? Oh, in my town? Ooh. It would be a lot of people. I mean, it would get a lot of attention, not necessarily in a good way. Definitely would get a lot of negative attention. Do you think she'd get the job? she would get the job if it were like or in study something but other than that no i mean you're not you have to she can't get a job outside of the fact that she is islam or right that, i mean i i would suspect people would discriminate right for but sure they, but they might justify it by saying well that would create a really bad climate at work and we wouldn't be as productive right so keep the government out of it. Don't run my business. Well, okay. What if somebody decided I'm not going to hire any Southern Baptist white men because they're likely to be white supremacists and I have Muslims and I have gays and they're going to create a bad environment. Are those Southern Baptist white guys going to want to be discriminated against? Absolutely not. 
That's why you have non-discrimination laws, right? I mean, who gets to choose, right? And so anyway, uh, that's worrisome too, because once people get to work, they should know at work, you shut up, right? That people should be able to distinguish their public conscience and their private, you know? And the, our founders really wanted people to make that distinction for exactly that reason. Okay, so here's the other article that, okay, he says this, I mean, this lawsuit exhibits a lack of understanding of what America is about. And it mimics the repressive Arab Muslim states, right? We're becoming more like these countries that we hate. The problem isn't that we teach a book about the Quran. The problem is that in Saudi Arabia, the students aren't learning about the US Constitution or the Old and New Testaments, right? Like college students everywhere should be reading all of these texts. And so they have that in common, right? It would be nice if every educated, college educated student in the world had been exposed to these texts, the Bill of Rights, maybe the constitutions of some other countries. That's the problem, right? And so we're setting a good example, right? We're setting the example of what others should follow. And now in the name of our founders, we're becoming more like the opposite of what we were supposed to be. Um, okay, let's see. Then we go, yeah, okay. It, okay, it bothers some, some people don't like it that some terrorists killed Americans in the name of Islam. And then we go out and make the Quran a bestseller, trying to figure out who they are. But it doesn't bother me as an American it's great. That's what you should do. You should go buy the Quran and find out what's going on. Uh, it would, and if I were a Muslim, it would bother me that people have been awakened to my faith by this outrageously destructive act, which is really not Islam's vision of a just society, right? The freedom of thought and the multiple cultural and political perspectives that we offer in our public schools are what nurture a critical mind. This is so important, you guys. It's a critical mind that's at the root of innovation, scientific inquiry, entrepreneurship. You know, a, this kind of education leads to all the things that made us great. When America was great, it separated church and state. And we had all this scientific innovation. We had all these kids learning science because we had to catch up with the Russians. And we promoted science because God wanted us to study science so we could beat out the Russians and Sputnik and all this stuff. And, and now in the name of our founders, we're doing exactly the opposite. So, so I, I just want you to, for a moment, appreciate what we, what's left of our multiple cultural and political perspective, right? and what's left of it and the cultivation of a critical mind. And that's, that's what our founders really wanted. So if you really want to be a good American, like go for it. Um, all right, a mon doesn't create a monolithic framework doesn't create a critical mind. Do you think that's a problem in our society? Now, what about homeschooling, right? Um, Okay, wherever there's a self-evident truth, there's no creativity. And that, that's, again, what I like about Socrates. He's always willing to re-examine himself. And he says to the Athenians, every day you have to examine and re-examine yourself and other people. You, you're, every day you're going to find out, geez, I really had assumed this. And I, and, and I have to reconsider this. I have to keep making myself uncomfortable. Um, 
So what do you guys think of that? Um, what's your takeaway from reading these last two articles? Um, Mia. Um, I just really think that, I mean, it goes back to kind of like what you said about the founding fathers. It's like, they definitely would be disappointed into, at, at like, as uh, like in what we, whoa, I, I'm learning my, I don't know what I'm saying. They would be disappointed like where we are now. That's what I'm trying to say. Because uh, I don't know, like kind of like what was said, but the country was essentially founded on di diversity and like, we are known as like America, the melting pot. And we get to have all of these different like cultures and people and opinions and religions. But in reality, when you have cases like these where people aren't allowing a uh, difference in opinion or just the introduction of a different way of life, I guess. Like it's, it, like you said earlier, I mean, it's dangerous, it's toxic and it's just not what the country was founded upon. Like we're not, we've literally like, I don't know, like the country, like we're going in the exact opposite direction than what they wanted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that. A 180. Well, I hope you come out of it cherishing the country you were born into and actually wanting to pass it on, right? I mean, every generation has to decide to pick up the torch, you know, and carry it for 30, 40 years and then pass it on. And, and after 9-11, you find out there's a whole lot of people whose idea of the torch was we're a Christian nation and we got to get back to Christianity and we got to get back to the Bible. We got to get back to traditional religion. We got to get back to uniting church and state. And that's the torch that they pass to their children, right? So, you know, Plato philosophy represents the opposite. It just says, if you want a free and open society, you have to do this. And it's a lot of work and it's not comfortable, but you have to, you know, be committed to it. Does that make sense, Mia? Yes, ma'am. Can you imagine yourself getting, uh, I don't know, burned at the stake for not believing in the city's gods? <laughs> or can you imagine Dr. Beck? you know, being accused of not believing in the city's God and corrupting the youth. Can, can you picture such a thing? Ugh. It's yikes. I mean, I feel like we're, I feel like right now we're advanced enough to hopefully not do that, but gosh, people, some people are kind of extreme. Well, Mia, can you imagine what the parents of the students I have who've taken a number of philosophy courses, when I see them at graduation, do they just come up and hug me? <laughs> or do oh, they, they avoid me, right? And I feel really badly about it because I don't, I don't think I corrupt their children, but they do, you know, they think they paid a lot of money for this school. And then they have this teacher that undermines their kids' faith, you know, that they tried to establish. So it's a really uncomfortable situation. I just wish it's not their fault. These politicians have set, set us up for this. So I don't really blame them. I understand. But I can't get through to them. I just feel pretty bad about it. Um, Melanie, what about you? What's your takeaway from these last two articles? Um, just kind of what Mia was saying, like we've strayed so far away from critical thinking. Um, like it's like we have a wool pulled over our eyes. Like we just, we see one side of everything and we're not open-minded anymore <clears throat> to getting to know about other cultures and other religions and how they're living in their society. So, yeah. I mean, as a coach, you're a role model, right? Yeah. I mean, I honestly think coaches, they educate students more than I do. Um, but, you know, you can, you can mention stuff like that, or hopefully you would have kids on your teams that are different. 
mm -hmm. that are diverse and just talk about the traditions or something. So you could have more of an influence than I do. Mm -hmm. I don't have any illusions about that. Um, but I guess to me, the main thing is the very thing that made America great was what I value, you know? And now I'm getting marginalized. Obviously, very few people sign up for my classes. Um, and it's just, you know, it makes me sad. <laughs> so I was all part of a piece. I don't know. I Do you all have any idea why nobody signs up for my classes? Are there rumors about Dr. Beck? Don't sign up for a class. Not that you know of, huh? All right, maybe I'm just not on campus that much. And so, you know, out of sight, out of mind, that's probably it. But it's, it's, it's worrisome, I think. Not, it just, it all adds up to um, heading in the wrong direction. So that's just something for you to keep in mind in your generation. And so next time we go through a lot of the same other themes, right? Islam and women, Islam and the environment. Um, there's a lot of documents there. And I think I, I, you don't need to read all of them. You know, um, some of these are when I went to Indonesia and I gave some lectures on terrorism, fatalism, fundamentalism, those are all from Indonesia. Um, and then the Islam and e ecology, I have a couple articles and you don't have to read those. I have outlines. The thing you really have to read is the thing on women. Um, and I think there's one other thing. Uh, the first post, the article on Islam and the environment, it's not very long. So those are the two that you need to read the, the prose, the actual what the people wrote and then the rest are outlines and we'll just go over them. But obviously you should be able to see it's the same main themes and we'll run through that. And then after that, I'll talk to you about Indonesia and then we'll have two days on back to religion and science. Um, so that, that'll be it, um, time to go, all right? Uh, Mia, are you posting stuff? Yes, ma'am. I turned. In, I just resubmitted two of them today, so I was going to ask you after this. Well, I guess now if you check them and then see what you saw. So. Okay. Okay. I'll go see if I got if I got that. Okay. I'll send you an email. Okay, that'd be good. Thank you. Okay.